Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning here at Emmett Grove Baptist Church. And this is Super Bowl Sunday, but it is indeed good to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? If you would, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 93. Psalm 93, and won't you stand as you do so? And we're going to give our attention to the text, and we're going to read together the Word of God this morning. Psalm 93, we're going to read the entirety of the psalm, very short psalm. Psalm 93 and verse 1 is where we're going to begin reading. The Lord reigns, He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded Himself with strength. Indeed, the Word is firmly established, it will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. More than the sounds of many waters and the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. And with that, let us pray this morning as we get started. Lord God, as we come this morning, we come to worship you, we come to praise you. But at the same time, we come broken, we come shaken, we come as sinners, God. And we thank you for that ultimate sacrifice that's available in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through which we've been purified, we've been cleansed, we've been made whole this morning, oh God. And so as we come, we come in that name to worship you, and you find our worship acceptable, for it is not our worship alone, but it's our worship that comes to you through him, through his name, through his offering, O oh God. In that name alone, there is salvation. God, we thank you. We praise you for your majesty this morning. Indeed, you're a God of majesty, as the psalmist is going to say. And God, I just pray that your spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth this morning, and that we might just have a closer walk with you as a result of being here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Majesty of God is this morning's title. But as we're getting started, there's a majestic animal that's called a horse. And certainly we find horses in the Bible. And I know there's at least one horse in heaven, amen. But there's a boy named Alan who had a horse. And it was a religious horse. And strangely, the horse only reacted to two words, hallelujah, to make the horse go, and amen to make the horse stop. Excited, Alan took his new horse out on the range and was riding it happily when he released. He was headed towards the edge of a cliff. Alan, terrified, forgot which one of the words was the word for the horse to stop. And so, wanting to prevent from going over the cliff to certain death, he bellowed out a prayer, and he ended with, Amen. Phew, the horse stopped. Hallelujah, he shouted, though. <laughs> and there we go. We come this morning to worship this God, but have you ever thought of the majesty of God and of the greatness of God and of who it is that we encounter this morning? It seems that this theme is just consistent through the Psalter. God, who is he? Again, as we come to Psalm 93, as with some other psalms in this region of the Psalter, we do not know who the author is, but we agree with 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God. But as I read of this psalm, I can't help but think of David. Perhaps on one of those starry nights, him looking up and, and looking out, and he knew well the moon and the stars and he would be awed at the majesty and the mystery of God as creator, Elohim, creator, God. But David's awe, in a sense, should be eclipsed by our awe, for we know so much more than David ever knew of the stars and of the regions beyond and of the galaxies. And Galileo, he would go on and he would turn on his telescope and he announced that the earth was not the center of the universe, and there was an outrage, outrage pope that told him that he should silence his discovery, but the truth was out, and it's so much greater than we ever knew or could think. 
and the expanse beyond what we could begin to comprehend. The stars and the planets, their bewildering number, oh, so many. But even more so than that, the depths of this God. The height of this God. The place of this God. We in reality don't really know who we're coming to worship and praise. He's so great. Lofty, dignity, stately, or grand. These are some of the words that are associated with majesty. And so as we come to this psalm, we consider his grand supremacy. Because as we look out and we look up, we can't know everything. And as we think of this God, he is so much greater than we could ever comprehend in this life as finite beings. He, he is this type of God. And so the psalmist invites us to come and think on the grand supremacy of this God. And who exactly is he this morning? Verses 1 and 2 hit on God's grand supremacy over the earth. And then we transition in verses 3 and 4. And we hit on gra God's grand supremacy over the sea. And then finally in verse 5, just come and check out the testimony of this God. J just check out the scriptures and see if they don't testify to himself and see if he's not proved himself again and again. Surely there is no one like our God. And the psalmist is caught up with this adoration, with this exaltation of God, and he can't help but praise God. And the more and more we understand God, and the more and more we understand ourselves, and the more and more we understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the resurrection and what now that means in our life, we shouldn't help but be able to praise God all the more. Praise God all the more. Growth in terms of spiritual life is, is perhaps most echoed and evidenced by an increase of praise for God. An increase of praise for God. And let's just be real right here. If you're praising God less today than you were a year ago, then folks, you're on the wrong track. And it's time to get back, amen? It's time to get back to that place of praise. For let us understand this as we examine the text here in verse 1. Know this, our God reigns. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Reign is the period during which the sovereign rules. You know when the sovereign rules? He ruled yesterday. He's going to rule today. And he's going to rule forever. This is an unending period. This is an unceasing period. He is the limitless, timeless, El Olam, everlasting God. Eternity belongs to him. He defines time. He's above time. Forever and ever and ever. You reign. This is your period. We are but mere ants. We're like grass. We're the flower that fades. We're here one day and we're gone the next. And yet our God is eternal. He is the God that reigns. Not only that, he is clothed and girded with strength, holiness, majesty, immortal, unapproachable. In this light, he dwells. Therefore, whatever opposition may arise, his throne is unmoved. He has reigned and will reign forever. Whatever turmoil or rebellion there may be beneath the clouds, this will not faze him. His reign is far-reaching and overruling because God reigns the earth is stable stability and the psalmist thinks of this in terms of creation but this also hits a personal note within ourselves when God is the center of my life I find stability I find security I find consistency and satisfaction but when he's not at the center of my life I find none of that I find chaos, I find anxiety, I find hurt. Man, I need help. I need help. Without allowing Christ Jesus to reign and rule in your heart, there is disorder. But know this, our God is a God of order. Of order. 
Secondly, as we go along here in, in verse 2, the psalmist is also caught up with the idea of God being eternal. Again, verse 2 informs us that the period over which the sovereign rules is for ever. We think of the temporary kingdoms of this world, of the Roman Empire, of the British Empire. We think of the United States. And yet kingdoms come and go. They fall and they fade. But the Lord our God stands forever. We're told that we're made in the image of God and yet God is eternal. And so also we are eternal beings. And God has placed eternity in the heart of man. Understand this this morning. If you want to live eternally and if you want to make eternity matter, you better live for Him. Without living for Him, eternity does not matter. Has no significance. So to live wisely, I must live for Him. I must focus on Him. I must give my life to him, he alone is acceptable in terms of what I should give my life to. A lot of people give their lives to a lot of different things, and there are a lot of different things that simply put, do not matter. What does matter? Him. Him alone, amen. The Lord our God, and that life lived for him. And as we go and we seek to live this life, we can understand in verses 3 and 4 that our God is unstoppable. If you choose in, in accordance with his sovereign calling to live this life for him, understand this, God is going to take care of you. He's going to go with you. He's going to be to your right, to your left, to your back, to your front. You've got a God that's going with you. If you choose to do it his way, if you choose to live this life for him, understand this in verses 3 and 4, and I hope you're getting excited and listening this morning, our God is simply put unstoppable. Now, verses 3 and 4 are going to give attention to the seas, to the waves, to the ocean, to the pounding, to the breakers. But know this, in the face of the storm and chaotic seas, our God is simply put, unstoppable, amen. He's unfathomable. He's beyond. He's above. And if this God is for us, who can be against us? What can stand in our way? What can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ? I'm telling you, do you have that assurance this morning? Do you know him in that way this morning? You talk about confidence. You talk about a self-help self book. Man, just throw it in the trash pile. I don't need it. Fifteen steps out. I got one step out. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's him alone. Pour the pills down the drain. I got what I need. I got Jesus. Amen. I got help. He is unstoppable. These really hit on God's supremacy and his help. Whether the waters rage, whether evil rages, let mankind rage. But know this, our God cannot be stopped. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devise evil in vain, the psalmist would say? Useless. For God, his plan cannot be thwarted, and he cannot be stopped. Unstoppable God. The psalmist speaks using imagery. He has in mind opposition that is both spiritual and physical. The psalmist understands this in humility. I cannot overcome my opposition, but he also understands this. I know who can. There are a lot of things in life I can't handle. A lot of troubles that I cannot overcome. I do not have the wisdom within myself, but I know who does. You know, this morning, I've got nothing to offer you. I can do nothing for you, but I know who does. And my job is not to point to myself, and your job is not to point to yourself. We are to point to Him. For He is everything. And what I offer is not myself. I offer him. And if I offer him, I offer everything. But I offer myself, I offer nothing. Understand that this morning, this unstoppable God. Psalm 16, 8, David says, I have seen God. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken, David said. 
with my eyes always on it, with him at my right hand, I will not be shaken because he's there, because he's there. And so the, the waters rise and the, and the seas, they rage, but turn your attention to God. It's interesting, as we begin to focus on God, our problems tend to not necessarily go away, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And our, our complaining and our griping about our problems, we tend to do that less and less and less because the object, object of our affection becomes God and not our problems. The one that is for us and not the one that is against us. Part of Satan's ploy is to get you to focus on your problems and the things around you than the God that is for you that wants to bring you above. Don't get caught up in the scheme. Rise above it. Rise with him. Amen. Rise with him. That is the unstoppable God that we serve this morning. And in case you don't know him, and in case you're perhaps questioning him, verse 5, the psalmist says this, your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. You've testified about yourself, and your testimony is true. You are holy, holy, holy. We cannot approach you without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, O Lord, forevermore. This is our God. As God's sovereign rule is stable and steadfast, so his revelation is beyond question and reproach. Maybe you have some questions about this. The psalmist says his testimonies are fully confirmed. He says the scriptures are trustworthy. They're trustworthy. Ravi Zacharias says this, lots of people have bought into popular assumptions and myths about the Bible. So if somebody suggests the Bible is unreliable, ask them to be specific. How exactly? If they claim it's full of myths, ask them which one they had in mind. Encourage them to read the Bible for themselves before passing judgment on it. I've noted that a lot of the criticism and the skepticism in regards to the Bible is passed on. It's passed on. So, so you heard your professors say such and such about the Bible. You heard your teachers say such and such about the Bible. Check it out for yourself. Is what they're saying true? Is it accurate? Is that really what the Bible says? God says, trust me, try me, prove me, and I will prove myself. You can trust in this God. You know what you can't trust in is this world. You know what you can't trust in is people. They'll fail you. It, even those that are closest to you, people fail you. People fail you. I've got one that doesn't fail me. His name is God. I've got one that truly knows what I need. His name is God. I've got one that really helps me. His name is God. Hope, where is it? It's in him, in him alone. And so the psalmist is encouraging us in this way because he's experienced God in this way. Trust God. Think of Moses. God calls Moses and commissions him to go to Egypt and to bring the people out of bondage. Moses is frightened at this prospect and he raises the objection, who am I to do this? Who am I to do this? God responds by saying in Exodus 3.12, don't worry Moses, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Then Moses says, when I say to them, the God of your fathers who has sent me, and when they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? And God's response is one of the most important revelations that has ever been given about him. See, Lyle, meditate on this, think on this. God says to Moses, tell them I am who I am is sending you. I am who I am, absolutely in control, absolutely the one creator God, absolutely the one who reigns in sovereignty and providence and who chooses his own way. I define what is right and what is wrong. No man can undertake me or thwart my purposes. I am the living God. 
And so Moses, go and tell them, I am who I am. The one who is stable and steadfast is the very same one that sends you. And I'll be with you. And I alone shall make a way. That is the God that speaks to Moses. And understand that that is the very same God that is with us today. Amen? Amen. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord, the God of your fathers, Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, he has sent you. This is my name forever. And thus I'm to be remembered throughout all generations. We, we read of God, we hear of God, but there's only one way to truly know God at the same time, and that is through the person of Jesus Christ. We, we, we think about God and, and we read it, and the psalmist, it's almost like he writes in a way that is a disconnect to us, but it's not a disconnect because of the person of Jesus Christ, because of his shed blood. Now I, I come before God and I accept this and I believe this. You know why I really accept the Bible? You know, I really believe the Bible, and in seminary, they teach you not to let your experience trump the text, and I would never do that, because the text trumps everything. But without my experience with Jesus Christ, I cannot accept the text. I can't. I've tried. In college, I, I could not accept the text, because I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ because I was playing a church game. I could not accept the text. I just couldn't. But, but the reason I accept the text and the reason I know this to be true is because when I was 21 years of age, someone else entered my heart. And his name is Jesus Christ, amen. And he is God's son. He is a sinner's savior. He's the only one that can give you help and freedom this morning. His name is Jesus. You want something? You want fulfillment in life? You want a high? You want Jesus Christ. He's everything. As Matthew 28, 5 and 6 speaks to the women that were seeking for him, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, for he is not here. He is risen. Come see the place where they lay him. And this same Jesus that rose in that tomb is the same Jesus that has entered into my heart. And you want me to give a defense and 1 Peter 3.15 ask us to do so, to be accountable, to be ready to anyone who would question us. You know my greatest defense. You know how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. As the old hymn says, he's right here. He's right here. What you cannot overcome and what you cannot outquestion is the reality that I have a relationship with him who was dead that has now risen and has now come to live and to dine and to be in my heart. That is what you cannot get past. The reality of genuine Christianity, the reality of that relationship with Jesus Christ. So yes, with the psalm, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that God is all of these things and he is so much more. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was a drunkard, but now I'm a preacher. Praise be to the living God. Amen. For his glory, for his will, for his purpose, and for that alone, there is no God like this God. Think of the hymn as you turn your eyes upon Jesus, and I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward here momentarily as we praise his majesty. Think of the old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. O oh, soul, are you weary? and troubled, no light in the darkness to see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. There's substance here, is there not? His words shall not fail you. He promised, believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell.
This really captures the process of being born again, coming to life, and then feeling God, and then going to the world and telling them, hey, I found something. I found something. I looked everywhere, but praise God, I finally found something. It's not even that I was looking for it. It's that he was looking for me. He showed it to me. And so I, I can echo again, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I want to ask our musicians to come, and we're going to get ready to have this invitation. But I want you to just think about this. Think about the preaching of the word of God and the music, the singing, and this is a worship service, and we're all here to magnify God. And so often we give intellectual assent to God with our mind. But do you know God with your heart? Your mind isn't going to take you there. Your heart's going to do it. Your heart will conform your mind to God. What is the greatest problem in our world today? It's not violence or racism. It is the heart of mankind. Because the heart of mankind is broken. And the heart of mankind needs a Savior. Need assurance. Need help. Need salvation. Help us here. Because God is here. Let's stand together. And if God has spoken to you this morning, won't you let him have his way, whether it be salvation, rededication, prayer. I believe we're in the presence of a living God right here in this building, right now. This is all about him. This is all for him. You're not even here for yourself. You're here for him. Whether or not you know that this morning, you're here for him. Won't you come and, and make things right with him? Won't you pray to him? Won't you just give him everything he deserves? And what can you give him? All of you. What does God want from you this morning? He wants your soul. He wants the entirety of your being. He is a jealous God. He wants you to know him in this way. It's on you now. It's not on him. He's made every provision possible. He's provided everything for you. You simply have to take. Come and drink. Come and eat. Come and know him in this way. Musicians, if you would.